All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the July edition of the HPC Best Practices webinar series. Today, we're uh, very happy to present Lavanya Ramakrishnan from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We'll speak to the journey to Strudel, how we came to embrace user experience in scientific ecosystems. This is um, one of many uh, webinars that we've been doing in this series, and we've um, developed an approach that we find pretty useful. We would appreciate it if you could put your questions in this Google Doc that we have a link to here, and I'll put it in chat again in a minute. Um, and then we will have Lavanya answer, written provide written answers to the questions after, so that we have kind of an archive of those. We'll also, um, as time permits, ask her to respond to the, some of the questions live so it can be uh, more interactive. We would appreciate questions at any time during the webinar uh, through the Q&A document. And uh, we'll, we'll ask uh, during breaks in Lavanya's presentation. And um, we would also very much appreciate your feedback on the webinar. And there's a, a link to a very simple survey with just a few questions, it takes you know two minutes of your time at most, uh, that we would appreciate you filling out to let us know what you thought of this webinar. Uh, and with that, I will stop sharing it and we'll start Lavanya's presentation. All right, thank you, David. Um, I um, just want to start out by saying thank you for joining me today here to hear about our experiences with user experience um, and how that got us to, uh, to, to the Strudel Project, which is recently funded in the last couple of years uh, by the Sloan Foundation. Uh, but I wouldn't be here today without the theme that is behind Strudel. So a shout out to my entire team uh, we are also expanding this team as we speak here uh, because Strudel is, uh, uh, we're planning for Strudel to be an open source ecosystem and so are bringing partners. Uh, but before I jump into sort of user experience and uh, software and things like that, I do want to start out with um, talking a little bit about Berkeley Lab. Um, uh, we have a magnificent view of the Golden Gate Bridge from up at the lab. Uh, but other than that, we also have a rich history of science, uh, but more importantly, team science. So Lawrence introduced this idea uh, in 1931 of big team science and bringing people from diverse backgrounds together to solve hard scientific problems. Um, NBNL was the first national lab, and we have uh, basically embodied this team spirit and team science and pretty much whatever we do. Um, and really, that's the spirit we come at this from a user experience point of view. So many of our teams um, tend to have scientists, software engineers, uh, user experience researchers, designers, and things like that, uh, because we believe that the diverse ecosystem is important for us to solve the hard problems. Um, my background is really in workflows um, and data management. Um, and really, the question that I try, have tried to answer over my career is how do we enable researchers to effectively and efficiently manage their computation and data? Um, so we have a lot of data sources here at LBNL, uh, which come from our user facilities, but also many large projects. Um, and looking at some of the hard problems that are data abstractions, HPC and distributed systems, uh, resource management, uh, also looking at search and data change provenance are things um, that my team has been investigating over the last few years. Uh, what's important here is as we were starting to build these systems, we realized quickly that there was often a disconnect between uh, our experience of, or our sort of uh, framing of what we thought the users needed and what the users actually needed. Um, so that sort of started out uh, many years ago for me, and I'm gonna to come to that history in just a bit. Uh, but really what I'm going to cover here today is uh, why user experience matters for scientific software, how our teams view UX for scientific software development, and how these experiences have led us to Strudel as a way to provide open source so tools to help teams build more usable scientific software. Um, so this is going to be the gist of my talk um, as we get through here in the next hour. 
Um, so how did I get here? Um, you know, I took a class in grad school, um, like many others who had to take something outside of their department. Um, and I picked ha human computer interaction. It was just fascinating. I heard the professor was really good. Um, and we talked a lot about design of everyday things, right? And how, uh, you know, usability mattered and things like that. I tucked away this memory and, you know, moved on, was a software engineer for many years. Um, and I had my first sort of usability aha moment uh, in about 2005 uh, when we launched the North Carolina Bio Portal uh, when I used to work at Renzi. Um, and what we had done over a period of um, months uh, was that we really built sort of this access to common bioinformatics tools, uh, build the infrastructure behind so that these tools, you know, the programs could be run and they could get results and stuff like that. When we first did our education and training outreach activity, I realized that a number of the users there were effectively running an application, copy pasting the output from the browser into a notepad, and then going back and you know, putting it in the next application, then copying it back to a notepad. Um, as a workflow person, uh, I was sort of horrified when I saw this and I was sort of like, why didn't you tell me uh, that you needed a workflow tool. I could have built you a workflow tool and you didn't have to do this copy and paste back and forth, right? So it effectively, you know, sort of was a memory and sort of a realization that I had not asked the right questions um, in the, and it had never come up in our discussions, right? We'd done a lot of requirements gathering and things like that, but we never really studied how the users were going to use this product. Um, and then, you know, a few years later, I found myself at Berkeley Lab after finishing a PhD, and then we had an offsite retreat um, in 2012 in Monterey um, on the beautiful California coast. And we had gone out and asked uh, all the other div scientific divisions what they thought they, was their CS priorities. Um, and every one of them sort of said workflow tools, right? And, you know, I had done workflow tools for a long time by then, and I just, you know, laughed and I was like, yeah, you know, it's a solved problem. Um, so a co-worker of mine, Dan Gunther, and I sort of sat at the back of the room. Uh, mostly were, uh, you know, a little bit skeptical that this was really a priority. Uh, but that sent us back to the whiteboard and starting to think about uh, what had we missed, uh, what had happened, that there were so many workflow tools and people weren't really thinking that that was something they could use, right? Um, and what we realized that a large number of the workflow tools but often built by developers for developers. And there was, you know, user experience was not at the forefront of the design. Um, so th that started a journey around user experience and starting to sort of think about what we could do in the scientific ecosystems, because we kept bumping against this again and again. So I think a big question at this point usually is, why is building usable scientific software challenging? Um, I think many of you here are probably involved in building scientific software and know many of the challenges that um, go with it. And I'm gonna give you sort of my perspective on this um, as we go here. But before that, I think I wanna make this a little bit more interactive. Um, so we're gonna do a little menti poll here. Um, I'm going to pull up the Menti screen so that you can um, enter your questions, uh, enter your com answers to the questions that we have. We have two questions. Um, and then we are just going to watch for a few minutes what everybody is saying here uh, before we get into more details. So um, here's the QR code. I'm just going to give people a couple of minutes uh, to pull that up. All right. All right, so in three or less words, what's your role in a scientific software process or team? Uh, just, just quick answers, just put them there um, and then we'll watch for a minute or so before I switch back to my slides, uh, before we go to the next question.
I love all these answers that are coming in. And you can see there's a diversity of roles that we see here. Um, and I really love the response one man team because I think that's uh, so true in many of our scientific environments. So, all right, I see some responses coming in. And we've still. All right, this is pretty cool. Uh, please keep going. I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, and what does user experience mean to you? User satisfaction is a good one. It's important. Accessibility, ease of use, how the user interacts with the software. User relationship with my product, how easy it is to use the software. It works. Um, efficiency and ease of use, how easy or difficult it is to use software. Minimal training, learning curve, user can install, run, and analyze the data. Usable software is a plus democratization. Build it myself or use someone else's product. All great answers. Um, and I love that there's um, a lot of keywords that you'll see in my talk. So hopefully this will resonate um, as well as we get through this. All right. Um, this is fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for participating in this poll. Um, I'm going to leave this on and switch back to my slides here. Um, so I think we've, you know, most of you have probably experienced this in one way or the other, um, but here's the realities of scientific work. Um, they don't fit nicely into graphs, right? Um, it's very ad hoc, it's very iterative. Uh, one of my collaborators likes to talk about how doing science is like working in the kitchen. You do a little cooking, you do a little cleaning, you improvise your cooking, you decide to put a, a different spice in. Um, it's very iterative and it's something that evolves as you go and it's not predictable, right? So, you know, there's sort of an assumption when we build software tools um, that it's some, you know, we can actually predict exactly everything and that isn't always true, um, especially when it comes to workflow tools. There's also a lot of things that uh, exist outside of software uh, for experimentalists um, that is sometimes lab notebooks. Um, there's a lot of context that is not always captured. Um, and there's a lot of human intuition that goes into the scientific process. And that is not, that's important when we build software um, and consider sort of the user's workflow and sort of mental model and things like that. Um, but most importantly, um, collaborations also have complex software stacks, right? So if you're not going to be able to sort of replace a piece of software in a large collaboration st stack that easily because um, these have been tuned to run on multiple systems, they're tuned to run across uh, different user groups and things like that. So keeping in mind that these realities um, exist, when we build our software, we need to sort of consider the fact that um, that has some implications. Um, but last but not the least, what I like to say is new work practices that don't fit into current work process will likely not get adopted, right? So if you have a new piece of software or a new service that uh, doesn't seamlessly fit into the existing workflow for a science user, adoption tends to be a lot harder. And so thinking about how you fit into that mental model of the user is pretty critical when you design software. So how do we see UX in a scientific software development? You know, I'll always like to say that uh, UX involves a combination of science, that is well-developed methods and tools, um, and a little bit of art. It's, you know, there's some amount of intu intuition, but also adaptation of these methods in scientific context. Um, but, uh, there is a lot of methods out there that many of our, all of us could use uh, to make our software better. And, you know, we have this 
we call this uh, project uh, that I'm going to talk about towards the end is strudel. And you know, we think of UX as being like pastry making and strudel, right? Which is um, it has some signs and then you have an art to make it better. Um, so how you adopt these in your projects um, can be a combination of those. So UX uh, approaches to us is really towards addressing challenges sort of in the entire scientific ecosystem, right? And it's connecting sort of the people and systems together um, through the application code, system software, and tools. Um, user research, uh, what it does is give you a process to verify and validate your intuition about what the user needs and convert that into some form of action, right? So it really gives you some methods that you can verify um, at what the user needs, do some requirements, do some analysis, um, and convert that into action. Um, so the user experience practitioners that in my team usually sit between the end users and the research and development teams um, and sort of do the, trend. I call them the translation layer between, right? And they're able to take some of the user requirements and needs um, and sort of take it to the next level and help the R&D team think about how to put that in their processes as well as in the development and implementation that they may be doing. Um, so what does user research processes provide? Um, you know, they really, if you look at it, um, they have various methods, and I like to classify these into four sort of layers. Uh, one is sort of discovery and exploration, right? Um, there's a lot of interviews, contextual inquiry, observations, also looking at competitive analysis and things like that um, to understand sort of where this product sits uh, or where the needs are set and sort of try to encapsulate in some very concrete terms what, uh, what is needed by the users. So the UX methods tend to go a little beyond sort of the traditional requirements gathering or needs gathering we're doing because they try to not only get the requirements, but they actually put the context around it but, and also think about what it means to implement that, right? So the next stage of this discovery and exploration process is usually synthesizing those information in specific um, tools and specific uh, methods, right? So you have journey maps, which usually capture uh, what a user is doing um, and different stages of the workflow pipeline on, on different directions or dimensions and sort of trying to understand where uh, the gaps might be where the you know hot spots might be, and trying to figure out where uh, there's more work needed. Um, there's also then a design phase where usually it's either prototypes or wireframes or detailed mockups that are developed, and then the users, the user experience practitioners, take that back to the users and do sort of this low fidelity usability test to understand if their sort of assessment is correct, and then iterate on them, right? Uh, what we find in scientific environments is, you know, you may enter at various stages in the project, right? You may sometimes enter right at the beginning, but more often than not, you know, it's usually when a product has been developed and then the users um, are having some challenges that we are practitioners get pulled in um, and we have to sort of figure out how to do that. So sometimes these methods are not, these are not sequential in stages. So we may do some discovery exploration and then you know, a little bit of synthesis, go back to usability tests, then come back to design and things like that, right? So these are just general categories and how they work. Um, so user experience research has been used in industry for a really long time uh, for designing our websites that we all use to shop various products and um, you know, do our day-to-day -day activities on the internet. Uh, but also in design of our phones and things like that, right? So, um, and so it's been documented that there are significant advantages to uh, user experience methods, and those include increased productivity for end users, decreased development costs and time, um, and an increased adoption, right? If you are able to fix the usability problems up front, uh, you are able to sort of get in there and get more users um, ramped up pretty quickly um, using your product. Um, but more importantly, I think the things that, you know, we also care about in resource-constrained environments like our scientific environments 
is sort of the you know fewer errors, bugs, and lower costs, and also better document, better or succinct documentation and training, right? You know, I say that if you can fix the usability and no one needs to read that manual, then you're doing really well. Uh, when I have to read the appliance manual of an appliance I buy, it's usually a sign that the usability is not quite working, right? If I have to figure out how to use my microwave by reading a manual, um, at this point, this you know usability problem. So what we find is often these tend to decrease the cost, increase the experience, um, and just provide just a whole round uh, better user experience uh, for the users, but better productivity for the team as well. Um, so in terms of how do we define user experience, it's really a practice of developing software, services, and products uh, that provide a consistent, relevant, productive, um, and joyful experience for the users, right? And we recently added the word joyful because we do think that's important in capturing uh, how the users feel about our software. And I think that's something we need to strive for. Um, there is a misconception. Um, I'm sure many of you are thinking, oh, maybe I don't need this because UX is all about being focused on graphical user interfaces or websites, right? Uh, that's not true. UX practices are employed to shape everything. Um, they're used to shape internal organizational processes to all varieties of user interfaces, including uh, APIs and things like that. And um, also just sort of this general notion of how interactions among systems and users. Right? All right. Um, so here, you know, very early in our um, studies, we did a little bit of research into, you know, what were our principles for creating usable scientific systems? Um, so we have a paper at eScience in 2017 about this. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail into each of these, but just a quick um, sort of hints on some of them. One is, it's really important to solve the right problem first for the user, right? I have a little image here which shows a external disk drives. When we talk to the advanced light source, in about 2012, um, you know, we went out to build them a data system, right? And wanted to solve their big data intensive problems. But what we really heard from them is they had a very simple problem where the beamline scientist was effectively managing a array of external hard drives and spent many, many hours figuring out how to keep them up to date, figuring out which hard drive he could wipe out uh, moving data and things like that, right? So what he really needed at that point was really a very simple system that moved a script that I wrote over a weekend to move all that data um, to NERSC um, and to a, a supercomputing center here at Berkeley Lab. Um, and basically what it does is it really elevates that first problem that they have, right? They are able to now think beyond that day-to-day -day problem that is um, uh, plugging them. Uh, it's also important to remember the context of use, right? So you, you can see a picture here of a user submerged, of someone submerged in a water. And we were going to build an app, a mobile app for this group where they were, uh, they wanted to be able to do data entry at the field, right? And, you know, there had been a lot of conversations with my team about what they needed in the app and things like that. But un it only became clear to us when we went and watched them in the field that they were actually going to be submerged in hip deep water. Um, and also there was no mobile uh, connection there, right? So this really changes the design of the system and thinking about what kind of data entry they may be able to do digitally in this context, right? And so it's important to understand that. Um, and then there's the user metrics, right? Which for us as uh, practitioners, especially of high performance computing, Performance is a big metric, uh, but that's usually not the user's metric. Um, and that's just a clue. I'll come back to this uh, a little bit more when we talk about our experiences and things like that. All right, so I'm going to take a pause here and see if you have any questions um, or comments or thoughts uh, before I jump into the next part of my talk. Yeah, we have a question in the um, process of being written. <laughs> so let's give it a second uh, to see if Alfred can um, quickly complete the question.
Otherwise, we can come back to it. Okay, that sounds good. I'll keep going here. All right, um, so I alluded to the fact that um, performance was not usually our, uh, the factor that the users were considering, right? So let's think about, you know, a user basically using a batch queue system um, on a large high performance computing system, right? What do they do? They usually get their code running, they, you know, get the allocation, then they prepare their code, they manage the data, they submit their jobs, they usually run it to a debug queue, um, and then they sort of submit it to the queue, wait for their jobs, um, and then they debug those results and post-process the data and often do a little bit of manual data management in that process. So from our perspective, you know, most of us building these systems, we look at this as optimizing each of these stages, right? So we wanna make it faster for them to compile and move data. We wanted to make it so that the queue wait times are uh, minimized. And we are looking to optimize the performance by uh, optimizing our scheduling systems and execution systems and things like that. And also, you know, how do you move data faster, right? Uh, but the key factor for a lot of these users is really the human time, right? How much, what am I doing in my waiting time? How long, how much effort am I putting in uh, for each of these stages, right? So we had once a user who basically said, yeah, I could optimize my code and it would run in about 50% of the time. But there's no value in me doing that. And, you know, as practitioners, that definitely uh, was surprising to me, uh, but really what ended up happening here was they didn't want to spend the time to optimize the code, but he also had a very important human workflow here where he would come in into work, submit a bunch of jobs, go about and do other work, including meetings and other things, and come back at the end of the day and check it. So in eight hours, you know, wait time plus execution time was just fine for him, right? So he was not motivated to optimize his code. And so it's really important for us to consider factors like this because we can optimize our systems, but if they're not optimizing their code, then you know, you're not getting um, the value you need from the system, right? So it really needs to be a partnership. Um, another example where we've had some um, sort of discussions are you know, around the user perceptions on, on, on wall clock time and queue wait time, right? We had once had a user uh, complained that he found the debug queue was not behaving like he expected to, right? which led to some analysis and uh, both from a quantitative side, but also a qualitative side. And what we learned in the process was he was really, um, had missed the fact that there was um, a whole different number of nodes at you know, the peak hours versus non-peak hours. This was documented on a web page, right? But he's coming in through the command line and this information is not in easily access to, accessible to him when he's looking at this, right? So trying to figure out how to build these abstractions so it's very clear for the users, they have the information that they need is pretty important, right? Similarly, you know, there's a lot of discussions around QA times and you know, how do you predict how much work like time you need and we all know that if you had shorter work clock times, there was a better chance your job was going to run faster. Uh, but a lot of our users basically said they just padded their work clock time because uh, there was a significant amount of variability in the runtime of their jobs. And so if, they, if the job died or got killed because it had expired, the time had expired, they were actually losing more work and time. So they were okay with actually padding and waiting a little bit longer, right? So different views um, on the same thing about how people sort of think about the systems and how they adapt to some of the system design. So it's important for us to remember that, you know, the science result is the metric for the end user where we think about performance and efficiency um, and we can't solve the next generation scientific ecosystem problems till we talk about this metric disconnect and talk about how we bridge that disconnect. Um, so fast forward, um, you know, we did a lot of work around batch QC systems and HPC system. And then, you know, we saw sort of an uptake of people using Jupyter on HPC systems, especially at NERS, um, in the sort of just pre-pandemic pandemic time frame. 
Um, and we, so we did a little bit of qualitative user research around that. And what we realized was um, there were a lot of things they were happy about. They liked sort of the streamlined Jupyter Lab setup, uh, which made it easier for them to access HPC resources, especially ex, you know, users who were newer uh, to HPC environment. Uh, but they were also happy about the adaptations uh, faci the facility provided with pre-configured kernels and environments and things like that. Uh, but they did find that the visibility on facility maintenance windows um, and things were a little bit harder to um, understand. And then customization of sort of that shared Jupyter instance uh, was tricky, right? Like, so the ability to do real-time collaboration, customization, sharing, uh, was pretty tricky. This actually led, this sort of study led to uh, follow on R&D work um, that we are actually just about finishing and writing some papers on, um, on how we can do real-time collaboration um, and sharing uh, with Jupyter and uh, HPC system. So, you know, to summarize, um, it's important for us to think about user view on abstractions and new technologies, right? Um, abstractions may or may not improve usability. Um, as a computer science person, I love abstractions because I feel like my goal here when I build middleware tools is to frequently hide that complexity that exists. And, but what often happens is there's a breakdown for these users uh, when there's something fails. They don't have enough information uh, but, and they don't know how to debug, right? We've seen this time and again where we build these systems to uh, what we call task farmer uh, on an HPC system, which would just take their job and do it. Uh, but what happened was what they loved it to, for in the beginning, they sort of often found it frustrating uh, because they didn't have transparency, right? They didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand how it worked. So how do you sort of abstract with transparency upon demand should be a key design goal for when we build software, right? Um, there's also an interesting anecdote we had where we've had a number of users uh, who've been using HPC systems for many, many decades. Um, and they would often tell us that they didn't, they were really new to the HPC system. And you know, what we realized was really users are always perpetually learning how HPC systems function, right? So because there's changes in hardware and software configuration. And so there's certain amount of uncertainty and unknown, and they're sort of trying to navigate that. Um, and so it's important to sort of think about this and uh, figure out how we align these uh, scientific and computing data worldviews as necessary to enable sort of productive use of HPC systems, right? And I do think we've come a long way with HPC systems in terms of usability, um, but there's definitely more we can do here. Um, I talked a little bit about adoption of new technologies, but I do want to bring that up because I think this is a major factor because, you know, especially large scientific collaborations have these complex software stacks. Um, and there's often a difference in timeline between these scientific projects and the systems themselves, right? So it makes it very hard for them to not leverage those novel features easily. Um, and it works, how do we, you know, how do we adjust your code and workflows and how do you maintain it for three different systems that have three different timelines, right? And I think that's an important thing uh, for us to think about and um, talk about as a community. So I'm going to next dive into sort of a different world, right? I've talked a little bit about systems um, and, you know, system design and user interfaces for system design. Uh, but I want to talk about sort of libraries and APIs and um, higher level tools that we build. Um, so in 2012, when we were first starting out with our user experience and we sort of revisited how uh, workflow systems needed to look like, we came up with this idea of let's you know build more a workflow library, right? And um, this was our first time sort of doing uh, usability for an API. And one of my realizations then was, while there was some work in the community, um, there was very limited work around usability of APIs and things like that. And so we had to innovate some methods uh, that we've used over time that take the basic UX methods and adapt them for APIs. Um, so we did what we called a usability test. So we had an API and we had the user sort of do a little coding exercise around them, right? And 
we had a set of names we had come up with and we quickly realized um, that some of what was obvious to us was not obvious to other people, right? So we had um, we had a you know a function that was called parameter list, and they said we have no idea what this is, right? Um, and then there was also a lot of push from our users um, to sort of talk a little bit more about what we meant by data parallelism. Was the data parallelism homogeneous task, heterogeneous task? How we would handle that, right? So they. The, while the API resonated to them, there were a lot of little details in sort of the function names and parameters and values. Um, and we had like dual syntax and how do you, you know, they were like, they put, called us out on it, right? And this was really a very useful study for us because we were very quickly, very, even before implementing the API, were able to fix a lot of the usability problems, right? This is a tricky one though, because when you do a usability test, you also have to think about backward compatibility and things like that, right? Um, and we were also thinking ahead of here a little bit because this was a new API, but we were sort of like, okay, if we make some choices here, are we going to be able to keep backward compatibility long-term, right? And it is a, it's a tricky one and there are no easy answers. I think the to, something to keep in mind is sort of, what are you trying to do for the users? What does it enhance the user experience or does it result in more confusion when you make the change? Um, and so, you know, I talk about this, that a part of UX is also organizational processes and things like that. So thinking about how you introduce change is something that the UX process can help um, you think about and implement um, as you roll out new features or changes to names and things like that. Um, I'm going to talk about Strudel in just a bit, but you know, one of our since this is a fairly new tool, uh, we wanted to you know do what we recommend everyone else do, right? Which is we wanted to make sure we were doing some usability tests and making sure that it resonated with the users. Um, and what we really found is, you know, it is pretty hard to make these tools easily accessible, easy to learn and remember and recover from errors and things like that and communicating next steps, right? So our, we did like a little hackathon and what we quickly realized is some of our um, sort of assumptions were not necessarily true, right? A lot of the users, especially in the first go, tend to heavily rely on default options uh, and prefer to tinker first and then configure later, right? So this really changed our thinking about how the CL, the command line interface looks like um, and how what information we was providing in the documentation, right? As the users sort of experienced this, they said, okay, I ran this command. Now, and now what do I do? Why am I doing this, right? So it really streamlined a lot of our documentation um, as well. And we knew exactly what part of the documentation we needed to focus on. Um, so again, this is you know a process, um, and but I just want to assure you that user research methods can weave closely with the R and D processes to produce better results for the projects and users, right? So I really hope um, you'll take a look at this. Uh, we've been able to weave this very closely with you know sort of the development, testing, release cycles, um, and making sure that we can sort of have a nice feedback loop going here. Um, so I'm going to take a minute here again and do the next set of Menti questions. Uh, what are your challenges in planning, designing, and developing scientific software? Complexity, time, people, funding, complexity. How to solicit use of feedback, diversity, portability across heterogeneous environments, clear requirements, portability across unique HPC systems. Software does very complex things, funding, resources, facilitate without doing, being able to plan for future flexibility. 
built environments. To specialize in the build one-offs, yes, on challenges that we tend to face for knowledge of software engineering. Yes, they want, users want everything. Um, and we have to think about how we can provide them everything. I think what complexity is too high. All right. Uh, what are your challenges in developing user interfaces, web and API for scientific software? Yep, scientists don't like uh, lack of expertise in this area on the team, development staff who understand user interfaces. Right, identifying users. Needing diverse team time, every UI starts from scratch, getting users to adapt, making it simple, but also flexible. Future proofness, anticipating use cases needs. Perfect. I think this is um, right on cue to jump into the next section. Um, I'm going to tell you how we are trying to make user interfaces easy uh, for the community using Strudel, right? Um, so what we've really done is taken our experiences over time, providing UX as consultants for design and usability research, as well as incorporating UX as part of our R&D projects to systematically expand and abstract insights from uh, into this pro into a set of products that we call Strudel. Um, really what our vision for Strudel long-term is it provides a set of products that help scientific software teams simplify adoption of UX approaches to enable a more usable, sustainable software, right? So we have two parts to our project. I have a little cartoon diagram here to follow along. Um, but if you have sort of a need for project planning, um, you have uh, the ability to, to sort of put in some things. This is still a work in development. We haven't released this tool. Um, it's to help you sort of figure out where you may fit in your UX planning and how much resources you might need and best practices and things like that. Um, the second part of the tool is what we've released at this point, which is once you give us some information, it points you to sort of relevant examples and UI task flows uh, and provides you sort of a base code to start out, right? So you don't actually have to develop your UI from scratch um, and you can use the resources you have. You don't need to go hire a UI developer uh, to do all of this, right? Um, so really our site, so our Strudel product touches sort of the scientific software design lifecycle from planning your project to designing a software, building a software and testing and evaluating software using UX methods. Um, so I already described the two products here. Uh, one is the planning framework and the next is the design system with task flows. Um, and I'm also watching the clock here. So I'm gonna speed through this a little bit. The planning framework really tries to take in information about your projects. You can see here on the right side, it takes information on your project composition, people and teams, software products, um, and starts to lay out what uh, you may need and how you want to think about planning your software. Um, the design system uh, is pretty unique. Uh, what we've done is really, it is designed specifically for scientific UIs. We've identified specific task flows and things like that, and um, thought about how we get that into uh, UI flows that can be used uh, by everyone. Um, so we used a lot of our history and our um, experiences and identified. So for example, you can see here um, that scenario selection, selecting inputs, dashboard summary of results are often uh, common scenarios for what you need in an UI and also history of what you did. Um, and so these resulted in us thinking about sort of how we design these task flows. So here are the task flows we came up with. Um, you can go to our website. I'll ha I have links in my slides, uh, which gives you more details on these task flows. But task flow is really a series of steps 
represented by screens, which helps user to accomplish a particular task in the scientific software's user interface, right? So if you have run, run computation or comparing data, it will be, provide you a set of UI screens that you can work through and customize for your specific examples. Um, so we have our design template and guidelines if you're used to working with Figma. Um, and then we also have very detailed instructions on how you adapt that task flow for yourself, uh, for your applications. Uh, we are also planning to run more hackathons. We have some recordings on YouTube if you want to get started. Um, so keep in touch with us. Um, and the Strudel Kit really provides sort of a React Java framework, so you actually can start out uh, with your UI development. You identify the task flow, and then you pick out the screens you want, and you can um, sort of go and do that work. Um, so I'm going to sort of quickly, you know, that is Strudel. I really hope you will try it. Um, and really our experiences and realizing how difficult it is to build UX and UI uh, was really the reason we went down the path of doing Strudel. And so I hope um, that's something uh, you will try out. And please let us know if you have feedback. Uh, we do believe that feedback will only make this product uh, better. So if my closing thoughts here really are um, software is ubiquitous and critical to scientific research. And software really requires ongoing usability and user experience improvements in order to become a reliable, sustainable resource for user communities, right? Um, the Consortium for Advancement of Scientific Software that's DOE funded, um, and a shout out to my colleagues who are in Chicago watching this uh, in the conference room. Um, it's really something we have to think about in terms of how do you do stewardship of software? And I believe that uh, user experience is a key component of that and something we should, as a community, think more and more about, right? And this is only going to be more true as we um, have AI and humans interact and we get into more autonomous discovery and things like that, uh, where usability becomes more important. Um, I think it's also important to remember that our environments are very different. So when we think about UX in our environment, uh, we are often um, met with a number of challenges. Um, you know, we've talked about, uh, we had a little bit of uh, sampling of the roles of people in different projects early on. Um, and individuals often fulfill multiple roles. There's not enough resources. Uh, management and planning can be ad hoc, right? And we don't have really the role of a product management uh, like industry does, right? And so, UX is often an afterthought at best, but really what we are trying to do is sort of saying, can we democratize some of these skills, um, whether it's single person, small teams, medium teams, large teams, so that there is you know, methods available and there is tools available for people to do user experience more easily. Um, and it's you, whatever background you come from, you're able to sort of you know, incorporate some of these methods in there. Um, I also had this quick slide here on software design styles. Um, you know, we have very different software design styles. Um, you know, a lot of uh, scientific software, I'd say, often develops with unintended design, which is you have a problem, you're trying to solve it, you develop a software, and the next thing you know, you have this huge software and other people want to use it, right? There's also self-design, which is uh, different from if you're developing for a user community. Um, but they also can, you start out as self-design and can end up in a different place, right? So how do you sort of manage that process? How do you sort of think about users in that process is important. Um, and a genius design, right? Which is, you know, we are often experts in the scientific ecosystem on something. And so we develop a software uh, which we know really well. Uh, but what happens when it gets into the hands of users who maybe don't know the data or the software really well, right? How do you do that? Um, and then there's activity focused design, right? This, you know, you want to provide some capabilities to the users. Um, so you are sort of designing for that. So no matter what style, um, you know, user focused design is important, user experience is important. So thinking about these software design styles and thinking about how you can incorporate UI UX. Um, I think is an important part of what we should be doing as a community. Um, and I you know, strongly believe that um, stuff, as I mentioned already, that software stewardship will greatly benefit from UX. 
Um, and it's really a partnership though, right? You really want the software stewardship uh, teams working closely with the community engagement teams and user research teams. Um, and often in large, in many projects, this is one and the same person, right? But thinking about those differentiation and the sort of interactions between those functions, I think is going to be important as we look forward. Um, so I wanted to sort of also put up some questions that we as a community should be thinking about. Uh, how is the right framing that will let us think about software sustainability and user experience? How do we democratize user research and software sustainability principles? How do we measure the success of software and user experience research, right? How do we sort of make sure that we have good success stories um, and we are having an impact? Um, and how do we organize and structure teams to ensure great software outcomes? How do we build a community? And how do we scale up UX efforts from in-depth single qualitative studies to quantitative macro studies, right? Um, you know, not everyone's gonna have a lot money to do one-on-one -on -one interviews. So how can we scale some of these up? Um, these are questions that you know, our team is thinking hard about. And you know, I, I have various collaborators, we've been talking about these things um, and I'd love to talk more with others who may have thoughts and ideas on these. Um, so two key takeaways as I wrap up here, uh, user experience and software sustainability are closely tied to ensure successful software. Um, and user research processes can significantly improve the research and software outcomes. Um, so please take a look at that. Um, I'm just gonna point, uh, point you to some of the resources for Strudel, but also our website, which is the ux.lbl.gov. If you wanna listen here more, we also have a user experience working group that's part of US RSC, and you can join it by joining this lab. All right, uh, I am ready for questions here. All right, thank you very much, Lavanya. We do have a few questions. Um, so first and perhaps most important is, um, does strudel stand for anything or is it just a delicious pastry? Uh, that's a good question. It does stand for something, but we don't uh, think about, it's basically, brings the words together that talk about user experience and learning and things like that. Uh, but I wouldn't focus on that. Strudel is just a delicious pastry. Um, mm -hmm. I was told by my team that I should bring pastry to every meeting. I haven't necessarily kept that promise up, so. <laughs> well, we, we expect Strudel the next time you have a tutorial. Absolutely. <laughs> Another question is, um, how do you juggle the experience needs of users and those develop and those of developers when you want to improve the experiences for both? Uh, that's a really good question. And you know, this is something we um, spend a lot of time actually thinking about because I think this is somewhat unique to scientific environments um, that the need to sort of optimize for uh, two sometimes divergent communities. You know, a lot of our sometimes, um, you know, we do this little exercise where we actually start out with the team and we sort of, you know, ask them to list out their challenges and their experiences and things like that and what they think are priorities. Um, so we kind of consider them as two stakeholders, the developers as one stakeholder and the users as another. Um, and so our study process will usually take input from both. Um, and to try to reconcile them um, as for a more, you know, user experience, global user experience uh, for both communities, right? And it is true that sometimes it might be more work or it might reduce the experience for a developer by enhancing for a user. So we sort of need to juggle that a little bit. So. All right. Um, and here's a bit more of a philosophical question. Science, especially computational science, is like economics. People will only do something if there's an economic pressure. So far, there's no economic pressure for research scientists to improve their user experience. Um, how do you push for an economic change in the software culture? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I... I think this is a little bit harder because the benefits for from a good user experience comes are more implicit, right? So uh, they are not easily sort of 
you can't write it down as easily as you can say something, right? Uh, but there are links, right? If you have a better user experience, you have more users. If you have more users, you get more funding. Um, so there are these implicit links that happen. Um, I do think we will see more and more, especially with AI and things like that, sort of this notion of what's user experience and how are you thinking about it? You know, I'd love to see uh, for any project, any proposal that's put together, uh, we already write data management plans. I'd love to have like a paragraph in a proposal that says, what's your plan for user experience, yeah. right? I think if it comes from, from funding agencies, we will see some of that. Uh, but I also think there's an implicit link between user experience improving and funding increasing. And so I hope people will start to see that um, as they see benefits as you use it, right? We've had a lot of rich experience working with different teams where, you know, it's funny because I go in and they'd be like, yeah, we want to try this out. And then the next thing they're like, we want someone from your team in our team, you know, on in every proposal and every renewal, right? And it's still hard. We are very resource constrained in our environment. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that it's it's sort of a, I'd say a cycle that needs to, it'll eventually it'll come together, right? At this point, we have a lot of momentum we've been building. Uh, you know, when I first started out doing user experience research, um, I didn't think we would get as far as we've gotten in 12 years, right? Um, you know, I have actually a fairly um, largest team for doing something fairly unique um, in the lab. Uh, environments and so and we are always um, have more work um, than we can always take on right so uh, I'm pretty excited uh, for where we are headed and I think the economic benefits will be seen so so I gave a philosophical answer for a philosophical question there so yeah good and and here's kind of a related question um, so which I think has to do with um, the the kind of work you're talking about being in in some respects more of a social science activity perhaps so now there are some discussions about inviting social science into ai but most scientists don't have time to expand their activities to include inputs from social science it's a good idea to be well-rounded and more human in scientific research but time is always uh short so um how how can we change the culture to get more attention paid to these aspects? You know, I think I always say this, it's come up when, when we've been talking about software stewardship and sustainability in the last couple of days as well, which is you need to start really small, right? I, you know, I don't think the right answer for teams is to go out and hire a UX person uh, full-time or anything like that, but have some partnerships that let you sort of explore it, have your developers um, learn a few things that they can do easily, right? And so it's a, I'd say, build small. Um, it takes just, you know, even just knowing a few things about user experience as a developer um, and as a PI can really change your outlook on what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And so really it's about starting small and building momentum as you go. And I think as a community, you know, the fact that um, I'm here giving this talk to me tells me that there's a lot of interest. People are want to do this, and that's always a good sign, right? So, Indeed. And uh, one last question. We've hit the top of the hour, and I expect people will have to go, but just one last, um, which goes back to that example you were talking about, about the uh, uh, queue uh, sizes and things like that. So wouldn't there be value in optimized code for the allocation of resources um, and suggesting that often uh, the users need guidance to help understand these trade-offs. So uh, it might be that I need to talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, with who wrote this question a little bit more, but the way I think about it is, yes, you need optimized resources, um, but I think the part that we often miss is the what is the user experience with these allocation models, right? And how do you educate and train the users with whatever you are doing? Um, and how do, you, how do you build an incentive system for them, right? What is the incentive for me to do extra work? Um, I think is something you have to think about. Um, and so I find we are doing a lot in the space of optimization and allocation and some in the terms of educating the users, 
uh, but really thinking about the incentive model and thinking about um, how do you improve the, how is this in affecting the user? What do they need to do? Um, is something we need to spend more time and thought on. All right, thank you very much. Um, like to express our appreciation for everybody who attended the webinar as well today. And uh, we look forward to having you at the next one, which is just a couple of weeks away on August 7th. If you haven't heard about that, you can reach out to me or go to our website and find out more. Um, and thank you very much. The recordings will be up uh, in fairly soon and we'll send out announcements. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you all.